Good evening. Good evening. Well, I'll start with a few remarks about the uh, nuclear situation. Uh, it is to be remembered that on the occasion of the first atomic explosion at Alamogordo, New Mexico, Robert Oppenheimer, the creator and founding father himself, entertained the possibility of a chain reaction that would ignite the atmosphere. And he had to be calmed down by the FBI. They put him away for a couple of days. And uh, 20 years later, in 1965, on a television program, there's a television program about the atomic bomb, and everybody appeared that it had anything to do with it. Uh, he said, we are become Shiva destroyer worlds. So more than 20 years later, he still thought that the atom bomb would uh, eventually destroy the Earth or render it uninhabitable. And he wiped a tear out of the corner of his eye. And various highly placed uh, military officials appear, appeared to say it was a very difficult decision. They're talking about the decision to drop the atom bomb on Hiroshima. But apparently, by the time they'd done that, it was quite easy to drop another one two days later on Nagasaki. And I thought, God defend us all from a difficult decision in the Pentagon. Uh, nobody does more harm than people who feel bad about doing it. Uh, now, the present-day apologists for nuclear power are leaning very far in the other direction that uh, they say that uh, these plants have a splendid safety record and there's been not a single death or serious injury, which incidentally is not true. And uh, you'll notice that all the old backers of the Vietnam War are now in the pro-nuclear ranks. Uh, William Buckley Jr., many others. Uh, not a single death or serious injury. Of course, Hiroshima and Nagasaki don't count. Uh, Nuclear power, we are told, is safe, and it is a patriotic duty to support it. They somehow uh, created that idea that it's patriotic to support nuclear power, just why, I don't know. They don't want to hear about chain reactions or cumulative damage to the human genetic pool or the very clear correlation between low-level radiation and cancer. And uh, they, of course, accuse their opponents of being... Uh, unrealistic, um, and one of Buckley's phrases is infected with latent ideological bias. He is really a master of the meaningless sentence. Um, however, of course, Oppenheimer's calculations at Alamogordo, does anyone know the literal translation of that? I know that Gordo is fat. What does Alama mean? Does anyone know? It's not Alma. Alma is soul. But Alma, I don't know. Doesn't anyone know here? Heavens. Huh? Alamo. Well, it's, it's the same as the Alamo. But I don't know quite what it means. I know what Gordo means fat. So it's that something. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, I was just curious to know what the meaning, the actual literal meaning of the Spanish word was, where the first... Hmm? Is there a purpose to the whole talk? Uh, there are a number of purposes. Summarize so I could follow better when I as you're talking. Uh, I, I couldn't hear you. What'd you say? Could you summarize the purposes so I could follow the argument better as you talk? Uh, well, no, I can't summarize and talk at the same time. Uh, well, anyway, Oppenheimer's calculations may have involved simply a, a quantitative error and given a sufficient concentration of nuclear fission such as could occur in a major uh, nuclear accident or a major uh, nuclear war, and 
Operation Shiva will be in a go condition. I just don't think, think that it's very practical. It never has worked. But neither has war. Hmm? I'm not challenging you. I heard George Wald speak in 1970, 1971 in Cambridge, and there was a little bit of heckling in Harvard Square about um, how to get out of the war, and George Wald said, you want to know how to get out of the war? Just get in your boats, and we leave the war. Thought that sounded right. What I'm trying to bring up again is why not? Even if it is unrealistic or impractical, why not just total instant disarmament? Uh, on whose part? Do you think that the Russians are ready? Oh, for I would, no, I would say, who are we to say what the Russians are ready for? What is your opinion about our taking that position? Who are we to say what anyone does? Let us take a very naive view and do what we think is useful. Let us, uh, why couldn't we assume a non-projective role? Just project peace. What do you, I mean? Well, um, this uh, sort of comes under the head of, you know, what would you do if you were president? Uh, I'm not pres uh, the president. I'm not in a position to make that decision. I'm quite sure that anyone who is uh, would not make a decision to um, to junk our uh, entire defense system. I just wondered what you meant by unrealistic. Just that, what I've just said, that it's not likely to happen. Right. I don't, I don't say that it isn't desirable. I said it's just not likely to happen. Well, that's all. Anybody else have any um, ideas on this subject? <laughs> it's 
seems to me, it seems to me that you just said only the president could make the decision. Is the purpose of your talk to in some way influence the decision? Uh, I don't understand your question. If only the president can make the decision, and, but is the purpose of your talk in any way to influence the decision? Uh, or is it I just to making, explain the possibilities? I'm not sure no, what the no, purpose excuse is. excuse me, I was making a few observations that some of you may not know. That the man who, who knew more about the atom bomb than anybody else, 20 years later, still considered that it would eventually uh, result in destroying the planet. I think that's the most valuable thing you've said so far. No. Well, uh, we don't have to keep talking about the atom bomb. We can talk about anything else. Uh, Could, but if anyone else has anything uh, further to say, yes. Could I ask you to what extent you think perhaps Armageddon is destined? Do you do you believe in this? Do you believe in such things? Uh, I wouldn't uh, answer an opinion. I just don't know. It, it does seem, though, that the people in charge believe this particular myth, and they're willing to go with it. Willing to go with what? Um, you mean that? Um, yes. What are they willing to go with? Well, they've built the doomsday machines now, and the yeah. bombs and so on, so apparently that's the way they tend. So we have a bad myth on our hands there, apparently. Yeah. That's all I have to say. Yeah. For me, this talk would go much better if we only talked about evidence and not about hypotheses. Thank you. What evidence? What evidence are you talking about? You have two pieces of evidence. You have given two pieces of evidence. I don't know of any more myself. Oh, I'm not an expert in this field. Yeah. Well, um, well, suppose we talk about something else. I'm sure that this subject has been pretty well worked over. Uh, uh, yes, uh, someone has a question there, I believe. Yeah, what is your opinion of the ERA and the women's movement in general? Of the what? <laughs> the ERA. I read in uh, an interview with you in Rolling Stone College Papers, and correct me if I'm wrong, you said uh, you thought women were a biological mistake. Well, uh, that uh, mistake would imply uh, someone who made the mistake. So, um, perhaps, uh, uh, it's, um, yes, it's a metaphysical, a very metaphysical question, man. It implies, it implies someone that made the mistake. Uh, what I am actually saying is that the contradictions that arise in a dualistic, um, universe, which is postulated on, um, Either our propositions, male or female, uh, this or that, are ultimately uh, unsoluble. Yes. Would, would you talk a little about uh, writing Port of Saints, how it was put together? Uh, yes. Uh, whenever I, um, I write a book, I usually um, use about one-third of the material. Uh, I have a lot left over, and... Um, so this was partly an overflow from Wild Boys and the Exterminator, and uh, was assembled, as most of my books are assembled, uh, sort of on an associational logic. Uh, those uh, things are put together uh, that are associated, uh, more or less, I'm trying to approximate what happens in a dream, the sort of synthesis of material. And that was the uh, that was the general uh, plan of assembling of the material. Well, um, let's have some other subject here. Uh, to switch from uh, atom bombs to something farther off, what about extraterrestrial intelligence, communication with other planets, 
is it possible are we going to communicate with them or are they already communicating with us well, if there's any validity in the uh, flying uh, saucers, sightings, etc., I've never seen one myself, but I know people that have, would indicate that their technology is far in ahead of, uh, far in advance of ours, so that um, they would be uh, presumably communicating with us. There may be, I mean, people have speculated that um, we have reached a point now where we are a danger to ourselves and perhaps to others in the cosmos. Would there so. be a, a possibility of uh, communicating with them tel telepathically or perhaps, you know, vice versa? Well, um, I think that all, all communication between, uh, between people now is, is at least partially telepathic. And um, I remember um, the Navy has a, um, a program of um, communication. Of, uh, so they'll know uh, how to communicate with alien, uh, alien beings if they ever uh, contact them. I think Dr. Lilly was in on that in on that at one time. This is all part of the Dolphin Project. Interspecies communication, that's the word. Well, it seems to me that all communication is interspecies communication. That is, uh, communicating with, uh, with another person is very approximate. So, um, I think that, that the whole problem of communication uh, is of such difficulty that um, it's about as easy, uh, it'd be about as easy to communicate with aliens as it is with anyone. Mr. Burroughs, uh, the U.S. government uh, gave up uh, investigating UFOs in 1969. Huh? The U.S. government, uh, factually speaking, gave up investigating UFOs in 1969, more than 10 years ago. Well, that's what they said anyway. I don't believe anything they say about anything, really. Why don't you ask them for their budget? So you can check it out. They're asked, uh, they're asked repeatedly for their budget, but of course, uh, a great deal of the uh, of the budgets, particularly of something like the CIA, are concealed. You've made numerous comments based on hypotheses, and I hear very little evidence. Well, uh, what evidence do you have to present? Um, evidence of what? For the questions, I have no evidence. Just like you, I've never seen a UFO. Yeah. I've never seen one. But uh, I think there's enough, uh, enough sightings to say that there probably is something, um, something to it. Mr. Burroughs, yes. stand up. Uh, I heard you uh, announce your, your new book, Cities of the Red Knight, is that right? get it backwards sometimes. And I wondered for uh, an author of prominence like yourself, uh, how you found the publishing market now in terms of being receptive to your own fiction and also just in terms of other people's work. Uh, I, from what point of view? Do you mean from the point of view of, uh, say, an unpublished author uh, getting published? I mean... Uh, well... That's my own curiosity. Oh, you mean from the uh, point of view of the, uh, the, uh, the royalties? And, um, no, I'm just wondering, uh, do you find that the, your own publishers are looking for different stuff, different material from you? Or, you know, are they making demands? Are you under demand in the sense of contracts and things to provide? Or are you actually at liberty to write and market your works as you will? Uh, I am completely at liberty. Uh, that is, they don't make any changes or ask for any changes. But I think that's true of, uh, true of most writers. The old days of, of editors who really edited, like Perkins, I think are pretty much a thing of the past. The publisher either accepts the work or, or, that, or they don't. Along that line, 
other. Is there anything being written today that publish? What kind of thing is being written today that publishers don't accept? I don't know of anything, any classification. Uh, I think it's just a question of whether they think the book will uh, will sell or not. And then, of course, there's, a, there's a, a certain amount of prestige publishing books that they know won't sell, but which will give them a certain amount of prestige. There's, there's nothing left like in the days of Naked Lunch when they won't take it? I don't think so. I don't think there are any taboo subjects left. That is, uh, that is certainly one of the things that has been accomplished in the past 20 years in the Cultural Revolution is the, um, uh, the abolition of censorship. I'd like to address a question to you about dreams. Uh, do you have conscious awareness in your dreams? Whenever you're having a dream, do you also have conscious awareness inside that dream? And also, how would you characterize dream logic? Uh, well, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. Very often I know that it is a dream. Is that what you mean by conscious awareness, knowing that it's a dream? Say, in your dream, can you say you want to go to a destination and go there consciously? Uh, can you uh, uh, find something, seek something in a dream consciously and find it? Uh, the answer is sometimes you can and sometimes you can't. And uh, I've done a lot of experiments uh, along this along this line because I write all my dreams down. I'm a light sleeper, so I wake up six or seven times in the course of the average night and write uh, dreams down. And um, I found that sometimes I'm able to control a dream, and sometimes I'm able to uh, direct myself before um, before going to sleep to dream about a certain subject, and uh, sometimes not. Could you give an example of a dream where you've had conscious control? Well, uh, following uh, following Don Juan, uh, you see, Don Juan um, uh, said that the important thing was to see your hands in a dream. And I made an effort to do this a number of times. And uh, only a couple of times did I succeed in actually seeing my hands in a dream. <clears throat> I practiced for three months at one time and found my hands in three successive dreams. Well, the, uh, the dream in which I saw my hands, I looked in the mirror and my face was black. I turned into a negro, but I looked down, my hands were still white. So, uh, I, I had made a conscious um, attempt to see my hands, and that was uh, one of the few times that I succeeded. Uh, dream logic seems to proceed on associations that is, one thing is associated with another, for example, um, a Paris, uh, Paris restaurant could uh, lead you to uh, Paris, France, uh, according to dream logic, which is also literal, uh, literal use of words. And I suppose you all know, to me, one of the most important uh, new um, facts about dreams is that they are a biologic necessity. Uh, see, they have made experiments of waking people up uh, whenever they start to dream. They can tell by the uh, rapid eye movements and also by the brain waves. The brain waves of dreams are very much like the brain waves of people when they're awake. And if they uh, keep interfering with the um, REM sleep, that is the dream sleep, uh, very soon the subject will show all the symptoms of sleeplessness no matter how much a dreamless sleep they're allowed. And eventually it would be fatal. It's uh, within two weeks or so. So we know now that dreams are a biologic necessity, which means that they must serve a very important function. Um, what do you think of the uh, decline of literacy that's been happening? Uh, the what? Decline of literacy? I don't understand the word. Decline of literacy. Oh, the decline of literacy. You mean that uh, fewer people can read? Right. <laughs> well, oh, I don't know. Do you think this was a fact? I thought everyone was required to know how to read, that they were forced to learn how to read. Are you meaning something a little more than literacy? Well, people go to school, but you know, not many people actually, once they're out of school, continue reading. 
watch TV and stuff. That's very, that's very true, but still, um, the book market has never been better than it is now. There's enough people buying books. I think there are more people uh, buying books, I mean, uh, per capita now, say, than there were 40, 50 years ago. Uh-huh, but there are a lot more people now. Yeah, but no, I meant, uh, I meant taking that into account. Oh. By, by, I meant book, by per capita, I mean, taking that, all that into account. What you said earlier about dream logic and uh, it following association lines, and then you said following the lines of the literal meanings of words or the literalness of words then I kind of believe dreams to be very image, very much images how do words and how do words and images relate here do we see images and perceive them as words or even in dreams well you have both uh, both words and images of course in, in most dreams uh, it's, it's comparable to a film and uh, sometimes, of course, you'll have, uh, have more of a preponderance of words and sometimes a preponderance of images. I uh, made quite a, a collection, say, of dream phrases. Uh, there's words that occurred in dreams are often just uh, words between sleeping and waking. And uh, you get a very peculiar sort of uh, grammar. I can remember um, where naked troubadour shoots snotty baboons was one. Uh, hmm? It came in his words. Uh, I've talked about now is uh, coming in his words without any real, uh, any clear um, image content. But uh, I think more often you have the uh, words and image mixed just as they are in a talking film. Mr. Burroughs, you mentioned the danger that we present now to ourselves and maybe to the larger cosmos. Have any good ideas for escaping from that danger? Uh, no. No? <laughs> Frankly, no. Really? I don't. Boy, in your book sometimes it seems like you're Well, uh, naturally, uh, Leary, Leary says, and I think um, uh, I certainly agree with him, that... Um, the next step is to go into space to leave the planet, but uh, uh, we're not there yet. Do you think there's any possibilities of leaving the planet, maybe in some unbodily kind of way? Uh, yes. Yes, I have a note on this here. Uh, here we have an artifact weighing about 170 pounds that cannot exist outside of a very specialized environment. Uh, sort of a whole uh, aquila. And uh, the official the space programs, they, how do they propose to solve this? Well, they're going to move this whole artifact, the human artifact, in its environment from uh, one place to another. It wouldn't occur to them to start from the other end. Now, you have an object, X, that's the human body, and you want to transport X, say, from Earth to space, from E to S. And X is heavy, and it can only live in a whole medium. Uh, so why not so alter X as to reduce its weight and its dependency on its medium? That would seem to be a logical approach to the problem. And this would not occur to the official programs because they accept uh, the, uh, the human artifact with all its limitations. In effect, they accepted limitations imposed by uh, Christianity by what uh, Crowley calls the slave gods. Now, um, it's the human body is much too dense for space conditions. We have a model to hand, and that is less dense. In fact, almost weightless, and that would be the astral or dream body. And I postulate that the function of dreams may be uh, to prepare us for space. That. Uh, and that is why they are uh, a biologic necessity. Well, you think
think there could be some kind of attitude of detachment from the body that could that could, could help be what? Pedal. Oh, some some detachment from uh, the. Do you think that there could be some kind of attitude of detachment from from this bodily nature that might help us along that way? Uh, well, I, I was just suggesting that research should be directed in um, towards uh, making the, the human artifact more transportable instead of spending all these vast sums on transporting it in its present, uh, present condition. Now, as to whether you could get a... Uh, dream body to exist uh, apart from the physical body, uh, well, that would be a matter for research, okay, which uh, I don't think very much being done on that along those lines, officially at any rate. Uh, do you still practice the discipline of doing easy that you described in your book, The Job? Pardon? Do, do you still practice the discipline of doing easy that you described in the book called The Job that you wrote? Uh, yes, I can, yes. It uh, still works. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's so obvious that it's the, the, it's the easy way to do things, but it's also extremely difficult, uh, extremely difficult to do. But... Um, just uh, this is not this is this is uh, what is it uh, vipassana, Alan? Uh, the awareness of what you're doing at all times, mindfulness. Yes, it really is a very old discipline and seemingly very easy, but in point of fact, very difficult indeed. But I find that, for example, if you um, drop something or uh, spill something, there's always a reason for it. If you can remember what you were thinking at that moment, you usually find that you were thinking about some person in an antagonistic way. It's as if someone suddenly joggled your arm. That shouldn't happen if you're, uh, if you're completely mindful. You should never drop anything or make an error. But uh, we do, I do, certainly. Could the dream body be an aspect of the water body, the water element, which we already contain, whether it's developed or not is another issue, but would, could the dream body be an aspect of um, the water element? It could, certainly. I, I was saying we don't know very much um, about it. I think the... Uh, the um, man that's done the most research on this subject is Robert Monroe, who wrote Journeys Out of the Body, and I was down to see him. He's got a lot of machinery there uh, that he, he thinks that he can eventually exteriorize people by um, a machine. And uh, I don't know how effective these machines are. I saw some of them, but I didn't see them in operation. And I know he's gone a long way since then. That was about three years ago. What I'm getting at is we have four bodies, the astral or the air, the mental, the earth, and the water that Robert Monroe also, I mean, is very advanced. He's, he is the closest. Hmm? He is the closest source of information to this unknown. I think so, yes. Um, He's worked very closely with Kubler-Ross, the, uh, the dying woman, the one that comes to see the woman that dying. <laughs> See Kubler Ross, you know you really had it. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Mon uh, Monroe has also had some association with Jane Roberts. Have you ever made such? Uh, no, I don't know the name. As, as, um, in what way? Well, he just visited to uh, to study her mediumship with this entity, Seth, uh, which you probably have heard of, maybe. No, I didn't know that. But next time you see him, maybe you could ask him. But he has he has done all this under test conditions, I know, and has actually, you know, um, gone places and then come back and described them accurately and all this sort of thing. I don't think he's a fraud. No, I don't. 
Although I can't say that I've ever, by following his instructions, gotten the same results. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on your idea that words can cause cancer. Can cause what? Cancer. Cancer? Yeah. You said it in the job. Uh, well, I think that um, they're probably part, they can be part of the, of the whole cancer. Uh, process. There's no doubt, but what there's a very strong uh, psychosomatic element in cancer, and it may well be associated with it. any um, any neurosis is uh, or conflict. Inner conflict is apt to be uh, more verbal than anything else. I mean, there's obsessive uh, uh, verbalization. So, in that sense, yes. Decisions like the decision to drop the atom bomb on Hiroshima was made by a very, very few people. Uh, in fact, of course, we didn't, uh, most of us didn't even know they had one until they dropped it. And um, you see, those people are in such a, um, a strange and really artificial position that, uh, that anything uh, sort of like self regulating limits would not apply to them. And uh, it's also possible that uh, some, uh, some individuals uh, may um, think that they have a way of escaping. They don't intend to be here when it goes up, in other words. That's something that, uh, a possibility. Um, what I meant by we was just the human race and that generally um, the, the masses of people who were more in touch with their but they've got nothing to say about it. They've got nothing to say about anything. Uh, look at the atom bomb people. How many people were involved in that decision? Just a handful. They, were, they weren't the human race. There were a few uh, officials and military people. We didn't, uh, the, the masses, the so-called voting public, um, knew nothing about the bomb. In fact, even in New Mexico, uh, where they were making it, people outside the, um, the reservation didn't know what they were doing. So, do you, do you foresee... What? Do, do you foresee destruction? I mean, do you... Do you th um, I don't foresee anything. I'm not uh, setting myself up as a prophet here. Okay. I don't uh, I just don't know. But the, certainly the destructive potential is there. And the fact is that uh, anybody can make an atom bomb now. Any um, physics major can make one. Not a very effective one, but, you know, it would take out Boulder, for example. It didn't take much of a bomb, but... I was reading in your um, Paris Review, you talked about a Dr. Dent and how he helped you um, get over your drug habit. I'd like to know what he, you know, influenced you with. Uh, Dr. Dent, Dr. Dent is dead many years ago, and the apomorphine uh, treatment which he gave is uh, not being used in many places. They're using it still a little bit in England and uh, in Denmark. And uh, some, I think they're using it also in Switzerland for both alcoholism and drug addiction. But it's never, uh, it's never had any um, um, use in America. I mean, they, um, it's been pretty much rejected by the medical establishment here. 
Uh, Mr. Burroughs, I'd like to ask you uh, your feelings about uh, the function uh, of the artist in uh, a society in which politics is so important in terms of uh, the life and death of the human race. Um, specifically, if we uh, can make a metaphor between uh, a heroin junkie in the United States as a profit junkie and a comfort junkie, isn't the function of the artist like uh, Dr. Dent? Uh, I don't quite see the uh, uh, the relation of the artist to Dr. Uh, Dr. Dent. Well, to me, the function of art and the function, of, in fact, of all creative thought is to make people aware of what they know and don't know that they know. You can't tell anybody anything they don't know already on some level. Uh, for example, in the uh, in the Middle Ages, the people on the sea coast, they knew the earth was round. They believed it was flat because the church said so. And uh, similarly, and of, and of course this becomes part of common knowledge. In other words, the uh, the effect of an artist or of a creative thinker is uh, indirect compared with politics. It's not immediate. Although it can be, uh, well, I mean, for good or for bad, it didn't take long for the theoretical formula of matter into energy to be translated into an atom bomb. And uh, certainly writers, artists, uh, are very influential in influencing thought and passions and so on. A great deal of the changes that we that have taken place in the past 40 years, the Cultural Revolution, have been um, um, at least partly uh, due to the work of artists and writers, filmmakers, creative, creative uh, work in the widest sense. Mr. Burroughs, do you feel that the use of mind-altering drugs increases your creativity or stifles it? Um, I wouldn't put it as an either-or proposition. Um, it, it, depending on the person, it might, um, it might um, increase it to some extent. And certainly, you would. You see, um, using uh, such um, drastic drugs as uh, mescaline and LSD uh, is certainly a, an important experience and I think that uh, writers have profited from that experience. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't see that um, any, we say moderate use of such drugs or occasional use of such drugs would uh, do anything to stifle someone's ability. Would you comment on the fact that the big science boys named the uh, Banisteriopsis copy element isolated as telepathine? Would you comment on this? Uh, uh, yes, I think it was just the, uh, uh, the rumor. You see, the medicine men, medicine men used it presumably to potentiate their psychic powers. And that the discoverers, the people that isolated the, um, the substance, uh, just were guided by that to call it telepathy, but uh, this is true uh, to some extent, I think, of any powerful uh, psychogenic agent. That there is, if not the, the actuality, at least the illusion of uh, telepathic contact. <clears throat> Do you know of any uh, uh, drugs uh, along the line of LSD or mind-altering drugs that have have been discovered recently that, that say we would not know about as, as common knowledge? Uh, well, um, Yahe itself has never been, uh, so far as I know, uh, isolated and brought into this country in any quantity. But there have been a lot of rumors. I mean, it's, um, 15 years ago, I heard of a drug that was so powerful that it was not released even for uh, experimental purposes and was only going to be given to the military. <clears throat> that they were afraid. I, I talked to a doctor at that time. I was much more apt to, uh, you know, to 
take anything that anyone gave me, but I would be think twice now. But um, he said that he couldn't take the responsibility of administering it to anyone because of the possibility of residual neural damage. Now, whether what this drug was, I don't know. But you see, as soon as you have a drug, it is immediately possible for a chemist to make drugs with the same um, potentials, but a great deal stronger. Uh, for example, uh, quinine, you see, in World War II, as soon as they synthesized quinine, they had anti-malarial drugs that were 30 times as strong as quinine. Now, the same would, uh, would potentially then be true of hallucinogenic drugs if they could uh, make a drug that was 20 times as strong as LSD. And they could probably make a drug that's 20 times more habit-forming than heroin if they wanted to. It's not much of a trick for a chemist. Um, in terms of drugs in general, um, could you say a little bit about how you see the concept of addiction now in terms of either a physiological, cellular thing or a psychological phenomenon? Uh, there's no doubt but what addiction to, uh, to opiates is, uh, is physiological. All animals have been addicted with the exception of cats who are allergic to morphine and they just uh, go crazy and they can't be addicted if they would die first. But all other animals can be addicted and have been addicted. Uh, so there's no question of it uh, being anything, well of course any, anything that's physiological is also psychological. But uh, by and large it's a physiological process which we pretty well understand now that the body produces a natural regulator and painkiller called endorphin. And if someone uses opiates, uh, then the body stops manufacturing endorphin. When the opiate is withdrawn without the natural painkiller, uh, any little thing can become uh, agonizing until the body goes back and uh, starts producing uh, endorphin again. That is apparently the, um, uh, the explanation for withdrawal symptoms. It's simply that uh, there's no endorphin being produced in the body. Uh, I was going to ask a question about reincarnation. I've read a book, I think it was Lyle Watson or Colin Wilson, I never can remember, <clears throat> about uh, a sect called the Cathars in the Middle Ages that were reputedly reincarnating. Have you heard anything about that? Or any comment? Uh, not about that particular sect, no. But, um, well, I personally uh, subscribe to the uh, theory of, of reincarnation, but um, I would say any, any uh, closely knit group, I should we say, um, where you get in Europe where people have lived in the same area for a thousand years as they have in parts of Switzerland, for example, uh, we must assume that the same people are coming back again and again and again, practice the same professions. Yes. I just want to, I think it's a correction, I think you meant endorphins, not endocrines. I think they're different things. Uh, yeah, well, uh, my pronunciation may be wrong. It's uh, endorphin. How do you pronounce it? Endorphins, endorphins. as opposed to well. endocrines. Endocrines are very specific, different things. Uh, I thought it was the... I, I meant... The, the, of course, there's a number of these compounds. There's more than one. Well, it's good to understand that. Uh, I just but, people uh, might go out reading about endocrines and <laughs> they wanted to read about endorphins. One piece of evidence that you gave I was interested in, but I missed it. What keeps people alive? What kind of dreaming? Or what do they die from if they don't have it? What? You said people might be fatal if you didn't dream or something? It is. Okay. And, and what, how do they, on what basis do they assume that? Or do you assume uh, that? They have taken first animals, and whenever the animal starts to dream, which they can tell by rapid eye movements, they wake the animal up. So the animal gets no dream sleep. The animal is prevented from dreaming. If they go on doing this for a certain length of time, the animal shows all the symptoms of sleeplessness, restlessness, uh, etc. And if this were carried further enough, uh, far enough, the animal would die. 
In other words, dreams are a biologic necessity for any warm-blooded animal. Would you suppose that that uh, carries over into daydreams too? Pardon? Is that does that apply to daydreams as well? Um, no, I don't. I don't. Uh, of course, probably the dream uh, the dream process probably goes on all the time uh, to some extent. Yes, it would apply to dreaming in the widest sense. What would that suggest for the Buddhist practice of waking up? Uh, I don't know if it would, uh, would suggest anything uh, specific. Uh, now we can go on. Mr. Burroughs. Yes. Uh, a, a man named Edmundo Garcia has just formed a church called the Universal Church of Hydraulics. He claims that water is a cosmic octave and that uh, a theology of ecology is in the works, the water works, as he says. Um, what are your feelings regarding the, the uh, old notion of the age of Aquarius? Does it mean we get vaporized or uh, any feelings? I don't know. I don't have any such general uh, ideas. Um, he's he's, he's uh, worried about the water table, is he? Uh, well, apparently that is... Um, that is um, something that would go short, get short very quickly as the water supply. He probably has good reason to be concerned. What do you think of the uh, possibilities of multiple universes and of the possibility that dreams are our communications with our um, own possible selves and other possible universes? Uh, I would uh, I would be inclined to um, to um, subscribe to that. Do you think it's also a possibility that uh, when you're dreaming you're not actually predicting the future, but when that comes that you actually made that happen drawing it from the dream? I wouldn't uh, go so far as that, but, but Dunn makes a very important point. He said if you dream, say, about an earthquake or a fire, and this is... Um, happens, I've had this happen. You are not dreaming about the event itself, but about the moment when you become aware of it. Uh, usually a newspaper picture or something like that. In other words, you are dreaming of your future uh, time track. And there's not much to suggest that you have any influence, at least not in that, in that uh, kind of dream. Uh, do you have an opinion on whether there's actually a group of people in control of the nation or the world that are using a, a rigorous, systematic kind of control, such as in Mayan society? Uh, well, yes, I think um, I think that the I've spoken about the atom bomb, and the very few people that were concerned in that decision. And I think that that is true of, uh, to a large extent, of uh, a number of decisions. I think that, um, for example, Western countries are, in point of fact, controlled by a very few people. As to any one group, um, you know, controlling the whole um, world, uh, no, I don't think any one group, any one group, is that powerful. But certainly, international cartels do control prices interest rates, um, all sorts of economic factors by agreement of a very few people. Price of gold, for example. And is, is that enough to control people's behavior? Or to... Well, if you can control the, uh, the economics of a country, you're going very far towards controlling the behavior. You're controlling it in a general way. You don't need to have any more control. I mean, there's no need for, for anyone to have control over every individual. Okay, thank you. Uh, going back to dreams, um, there's a poet, his name I think is Brian Geisen, who created a machine called the Dream Machine. Do you know anything about that? Uh, yes, I was there when it was uh, created. It is, um, it is a, a, a stroboscope, in effect. It's flicker. 
And uh, Gray Walters, um, um, who was one of the early experimenters with Flicker, found that it produced uh, many of the effects of uh, hallucinogenic drugs, that is, breaking down the, uh, the, compart the compartments of the senses, that is, seeing, uh, seeing sounds and uh, hearing odors and all that uh, sort of thing that uh, occurs with hallucinogenic drugs could be produced by Flicker which is pulses of light into the eye at a certain frequency, at the alpha frequency, I think between 8 and uh, 15 per second. And this is a device for doing that. It has a, a uh, light in a revolving cylinder with slots so that it uh, can be set for a certain frequency. Now, uh, what actually happens? Uh, it has some of the effects, as I, as I uh, said, of uh, hallucinogenic drugs, and um, you see all sorts of patterns, and uh, sometimes visions like cities, things like that. Is there? A, I heard that there's a dream machine in the basement of the Museum of Modern Art. Is that um, I think there. I think they have one, and I, there's one also in the Beaubourg Museum in Paris. I think that uh, Brian is um, going to install another one there at, at the Beaubourg in Paris. Uh, in a dream once, uh, I uh, was able to do algebra in the dream, and I remembered what I'd done in the dream, and I had I had never been able to do it before. And when I woke up, I was able to do these equations. I, and I don't know how to explain it. Well, uh, there's a famous story about uh, a man who solved an equation in a dream, I believe. Uh, he saw the equation had been bothering him, and all of a sudden it joined in a certain way. And uh, so I think that this is an uh, experience that happens quite often. The idea that dreams are completely illogical, of course, is not true at all. I have gotten uh, from dreams perfectly coherent narrative stories. No one would know it was a dream. Um, sometimes I get a whole chapter that way, which I've, uh, in fact, read. I, I pick, a, pick up a book in a dream and read it, and then I'm able sometimes to transcribe that uh, later when I'm awake. Back to art and politics, just as um, nobody's really paying attention to the anti-nuclear movement except people who are already anti-nuclear, um, I was wondering who you consider you, your audience to be, and is anybody really affected by art but artists? Uh, I think they are profoundly affected by, um, by artists, uh, but perhaps not, as, not directly or immediately. Uh, by artists and by um, creative ideas. My heavens, look at, look at what came of Karl Marx. How many people have read Karl Marx? Uh, it isn't necessary that so many people have read them. Look at the number of people who are affected by it. And um, I think that the uh, example, as I was pointing out, the whole cultural revolution, which has taken place in the past 40 years, um, is cert certainly um, to a large extent due to artists and creative uh, creative people as filmmakers and so on. Could you talk a little bit about your interest in the Johnson family? About what? Your interest in the Johnson family? Uh, well, yes, I was... Um, I am... Uh, writing a book on the Johnson family, called the Johnson family, I can just read you the... It was a turn of the century expression to designate sort of good bums and thieves, and it was elaborated then into a code of conduct about uh, a Johnson, uh, what a Johnson does and does not do. A Johnson honors his obligations, his word is good, and he's a good man to do business with. A Johnson minds his own business. He is not a snoopy, tail-bearing, interfering, self-righteous type of person. And a Johnson will help when help is needed. He will not stand by while someone is drowning or trapped under a burning car. I had a friend who was uh, 
had an accident. He hit a cow going 90 miles an hour and was trapped under his car. And some salesmen came along. They wouldn't even get out of their car. And some uh, truck driver came along and got him out. So, um, and the show business uh, designation for Johnson is a, he's good people. So, um, it also occurred to me that uh, in the uh, planning this book, that the Johnsons are also uh, would be ideal people to have in space with you. And I postulated uh, that, um, for example, um, postulate that there's no privacy and no deceit possible in space, that your innermost thoughts and feelings and intentions are immediately apparent to those around you, so you want to be very careful who is around you. already said something about the connection between dreams and your writing. Um, some people have thought there was an important connection between watching a movie and having a dream. Suzanne Langer, I think, for example. And I was wondering if you could comment on the relation between movies and your writing on the one hand and movies and dreams on the other. Well, because a dream is, in, uh, in point of fact, uh, a film. Um, and also, people, uh, I myself, and I suppose everybody, uh, frequently dreams about films that they've seen. There's certainly a feedback, immediate feedback there. Um, well, that's about all. I'm coming back to the nuclear because uh, I've been sitting here and listening to the younger generation. Uh, concerned about nuclear and they have been the only group uh, that had had any impact at all on the protesting of the nuclear whereas if the young people will work upon the older people who are plugged in to what they call the bottom line to make money and also because they fear that they're going to be without any energy now if the young people will start to working on the older people I think we can make a big impact. That's my comment. Well, uh, well, one one hopes so, yes. But um, I think a lot of the uh, the pro nuclear people are so uh, are so set in that uh, opinion they're not going to change because they just don't want to hear anything about the facts. They completely close their mind to the dangers of low-level radiation, any of those things. I mean, um, naturally, they never heard of Oppenheimer, let alone of, the, of uh, what Oppenheimer thought about the atom bomb and its potentials. And they're really just um, set in ignorance. I don't know how, uh, how successful anyone would be in changing their mind. They're pretty stupid anyway. Getting back to movies and dreams and what you said about the flicker machine, I was wondering what kind of influence the television has uh, in altering your mind and how you think about that. Well, I don't, um, I hardly look at television, so I don't know, I don't have much of an opinion. Yeah, but how, how about the millions of people that do? I know, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's, a continual, uh, it's a continual input. Uh, that must that must be having a very profound effect on their mind, quite apart from even the content. Just the fact that they're sitting there and uh, and watching this thing for hours on end. Is, is there some kind of theory that the that the the flicker of the television set creates a kind of hypnosis that can uh, be very influential? Yeah, oh, I've heard of that, and I've heard also that um, something about uh, microwaves, actual damage from certain types. A certain uh, television reception. Do you think you could feed back on this? In other words, do you think the TV is giving off vibrations? Do you think that the human being could actually feed back down the line? You mean uh, that he could affect television? Uh, well, I guess... 
well in the terms of, of what I'm saying, well, you know, music yes, and feedback. Uh, yes, it, it's quite possible. You see, they've done um, research of attaching, actually, the mind um, to a computer so that uh, there was a feedback between the mind and the computer and the, uh, you, the mind was giving electrical signals to the computer. So, uh, yes, you could um, actually at least change the stations <laughs> by thinking about it. That's potentially quite possible. There's a lot about that in The, uh, in the Secret Life of Plants. Uh, my, how many of you have read that book? It's quite, you know, remember the man that had a, had um, a circuit set up so that he could turn on his television by thinking about it, even from another city. Yes, it certainly is possible. Uh, you, you've experimented with a Reichian orgone accumulator. D did you have any uh, results? Uh, well, yes, I think there's no doubt but what something is happening. Uh, any, I had people go into, you know, not knowing nothing about Reich and not being told uh, what to expect, and they all reported that something was happening in there, that there's a prickling of the skin, and uh, they thought that it was attached up to some kind of an electrical uh, system. Uh, and I do think that um, it is very important uh, for cancer, I mean, for the possibility of cancer, uh, cure and has been completely neglected by the medical establishment but a doctor with a space program named Cone came out with uh, his electrical cell theory of cancer which is identical with Reich's theory although he gave no acknowledgement to Reich Mr. Burroughs because you're such an acclaimed writer do you consider writers as not spiritual but social prophets and do you and could you cite examples through your work if you feel so? Uh, I didn't quite, I didn't quite get the uh, the question. I think do you there, feel I, that writers are social prophets, and if you feel that way, could you cite an example with your works? Thank you. Uh, I don't think that writer is necessarily a social prophet. Uh, he may, uh, he may well. Uh, I mean, there may well be. It, uh, events in his uh, in his book that uh, later happened in fact and of course the writers certainly have an influence on events that is people um, model themselves on writers like um, a whole generation uh, model themselves on uh, Fitzgerald's writing that's not exactly prophecy that's uh, influence rather than, uh, than prophecy Mr. Burroughs, uh, would you please comment on the possibility that since the atomic bomb, the credibility in the uh, scientific community has been destroyed to the uh, extent that the opinions of that community are uh, pretty much worthless in undoing the damage which has been done? Well, undoubtedly, they have uh, they have lost a degree of credibility by uh, getting something started which they are apparently apparently unable to control and uh, they can't uh, have come up with no solution to the problem of atomic waste so uh, that is certainly uh, enough to destroy anyone's credibility to have create, created a problem of such magnitude uh, with, uh, without a solution to it I have a two-fold question which is first uh, about a year ago, I was stopped. I was in a I was in a movie, and uh, I started talking to someone, and he explained to me he was a filmmaker, and he was involved in mind movies. And uh, do you know anything about mind movies? Uh, no, I don't know what he means. So did he explain to you what he meant by well, a mind movie? What uh, he was working on this process with other filmmakers and engineers, and where they take a uh, through a through a, a magnetic tape. They uh, pass it through a computer, the signal alpha and beta signals, and then you experience the movie in your mind as opposed to on a screen. Well, uh, I think that this is something to, uh, towards which uh, movie makers are, are striving, but I don't think they've, uh, I don't know if they've accomplished it yet. Uh, so, I, yeah. the 
second question is you mentioned uh, organ energy and uh, there's a theory that uh, UFOs are somehow propelled by that uh, no I didn't uh, suggest that UFOs were propelled no no that there's a do you know anything about that understand there are people called arhats who are in uh, deep states of meditation in caves in various parts of the world who are seeking to um, change the destructive direction and I was wondering if you have any comments on that and also what I'm getting at is what power people who meditate might exert on these questions destructive questions well, uh, theoretically, they could assert almost unlimited power. That is, uh, there's no doubt about it, but what uh, human beings use just a, a tiny fraction of their actual potentials. Um, that is, we have potentially um, photographic memory for all everything that's happened to us. Uh, we know such a tremendous amount that we know and don't know that we know. And... Um, so potentially, uh, someone could very directly influence the minds of politicians and military men as to whether they are actually able to do this at this time, I just don't know. Where are these people uh, supposedly located? Is there any suggestions? In the Himalayan mountains. This was told to me by, by a Sufi master. Well, it's possible, and we certainly hope so. I only hope that someone knows what they're doing. Um, what, what developments do you think we'll see happen in poetic and literary form in the next 20 years into the 21st century? Uh -huh. uh, that's uh, a very, very difficult to say. For example, painting. Um, I, where painting is now, I, I just don't know. They've gotten away almost from the... Um, to a point where they don't have anything to sell. They've lost the article. Now, um, I know a painter named uh, Les Levine, he puts on a show and I said, well, Les, what are you selling? Where is the thing that people, people can buy? And it isn't there, it's, uh, it's a happening. It's as if the, uh, the writer had somehow gotten rid of the book, the painter has gotten rid of the canvas. Uh, what, uh, what they are selling um, then is a, is a happening an event like this guy that did the um, the wall or the you know, what was it you know. so where they can go from here how, how they can go further I don't know and writing seems to be uh, have reached a sort of a limit there's a there's a limit really a definite limit to experimental writing if you want people to read it uh, for example you could not do in writing what is called minimal expressionism where you have say um, a canvas with slightly different shades of, of the same color on it. It would be uh, intolerable in writing to have the same thing said with very slight uh, variations. So I don't know as, as writing is going, um, going very much further, um, going to be very much different, say, in the next 20 years than it is now. There's one invention that might um, have, um, if they ever really perfected uh, the uh, a throat mic that was sensitive enough to pick up subvocal speech. Then you would have something almost as revolutionary as the camera was for artists because you wouldn't have to guess that when you were transcribing um, someone's uh, stream of consciousness, you could actually record it. But the, uh, the date there is no uh, microphone that's sensitive enough to pick this up we know that sub vocal speech makes sound but we can't pick it up yet do you think we're like uh, dependent then on some sort of technological development or discovery in order to uh, move writing ahead move writing further move it out there well um, you'd have to specify just what uh, well, we're moving. Um, undoubtedly, this, uh, as I said, this to uh, record subvocal speech would require equipment we don't have yet.
but there's no reason why we shouldn't uh, have it. I mean, it's certainly within the realm of possibilities. I'd like to ask you a question about your own personal literary habits at this time. Would you, uh, could you go into what uh, your current reading is right now and uh, any recommended reading you might have to suggest? Well, actually, I've got a, a reading list I gave uh, last summer, a course that I called uh, Creative Reading, and I have a, a list, um, a reading list, which I'm continually adding to. I mean, if you wanted to uh, see me after class and get a copy, uh, have a copy made. Uh, I read a, I read a great deal. I read a great deal of um, just sort of bestsellers. And, a book that I recommend that I just read is uh, Shibumi. It's uh, violently anti-American and it's a bestseller, which is interesting in itself. Uh, there's another uh, very good one um, called The Contaminant about how uh, Russia and America are uh, inducing cancer, that is, um, you know, putting cancer producing agents into the food. Uh, and First, uh, the Americans do it, and then they find out the Russians are doing it as well. It's, it's uh, all too probable, actually. The same is true about this book, Shibumi. The, the, um, the story is that the America is really run by something called the Mother Company, which is above the CIA, and nobody knows about it. And they are fixing petroleum prices. It's, it's essentially a, a cartel of petroleum and, and uh, energy. Sounds uh, all too, uh, all too likely. It's all done by they, they, their whole power depends on a computer called Fat Boy. What? Very interesting book. I recommend it. Anyone read it? Nobody's read Shibumi. Hmm. Uh, yes, it's it's uh, Japanese uh, training or word. Uh, it's all over. I mean, it's a big bestseller. You can't miss it. That's well worth reading. So. Uh, the manager of Lawrence Cavell's is reading Shibumi and enjoying it. The manager of Lawrence Cavell's is reading Shibumi. Uh, what role does music play in your life? Music? And has there ever been a serious art music composer that you've... Uh, been affected by or liked? Uh, no, I really, uh, I really don't know. I'm not at all knowledgeable about music. I like Moroccan music and uh, Indian music. I'm not much into rock and roll, and uh, I just don't know much about music, frankly. Could you comment on what inspired you to use the cut-up method, and if so, uh, uh, do you still use this as a method of writing composition? Uh, it was not my invention or my idea at all. It was Brian Geisen who said that uh, writing is 50 years behind painting, and he simply applied the montage method, which had at that time, this was in 1959, been used for 50 years in painting. It was pretty old hat in painting, actually, at that point. Well, now, uh, this applies to what I said about making people aware of what they know and don't know that they know, uh, because he simply made explicit with scissors uh, what happens all the time in the human nervous system, that is, you walk around the block and come back, what you, come back and put down what you've seen, either on paper or on canvas. Uh, you've seen a, a melange of fragments. It isn't, a, you haven't seen anything uh, sequential, uh, narrative or picture and uh, whenever you walk down the street your consciousness is cut by random factors or when you look out the window this is a process that's going on all the time and the cut up method simply made this explicit um, in following on that uh, question about the origin of cut up and function and the, your statement before that there is a limit to experimental art if you want to have anybody read your book or look at your mm -hmm. work. Uh, what is your uh, opinion, or how do you, what's your attitude toward a soft machine, uh, ticket that exploded, and Nova Express as 
quote, far out experimental works in uh, Finnegan's Wake, say. And uh, what uh, what lessons have you learned from that kind of experiment? And uh, uh, what generalizations have you derived from the experience? Yes. Well, I, uh, I feel that in those three books, I was uh, perhaps too much taken up in the experiment itself. Uh, instead of uh, using, uh, using the material only insofar as it contributed to the, uh, the work as a whole. And uh, so I don't, uh, I use cut-ups now just in certain um, uh, situations. For example, if you're trying to um, portray a state of delirium, I think they're very, very useful for that. I say if someone has uh, driven from the airport to his hotel and he's lying down and, and pictures are flicking through his mind, that the uh, cut-up method uh, works very well there. But there is a tendency with writers, I think, to, to get too hung up on an experimental line of, of writing so that they don't uh, get back uh, to uh, coherent coherence where the, they can be read. I think that we're still going to have, um, we still need um, sequential narrative if people are going to read, uh, read books. What stages of, um, or phases of consideration did you go through before you arrived at this conclusion? What stages of practice of cut-up did you go through? You know, the first work, say, minutes ago, was pure cut-up and pure random, without particular editing. Then there was construction of thematic novels with uh, cut-up, with the cut-ups uh, uh, aggregated around the theme. Uh, but the whole, the whole novel composed of cut-up material. Then was there an intermediary stage before you went back to narrative? Uh, no. Um, there are all sorts of combinations um, uh, possible. Lots of times I'll cut up a page and I don't get anything. Maybe I get one sentence and put it back in so you, you can't even tell that it's a, a cut up. Um, there's no necessity of using everything that you get. But very soon I started editing and rearranging and, and taking uh, what I wanted from the, uh, from the cut-ups. Did the cut-up uh, style uh, affect your own uh, brain functioning or your own thinking process or your own composition process or your own stylistics? Yes, I would say that the, uh, the cut-ups uh, give a general, because it's making explicit something that happens all the time, uh, increases your range of awareness and therefore um, well contributes to gives you a, a wider range of, of um, a wider, wider range for your uh, of your fictional uh, viewpoint you're talking about uh, mental awareness yes does it also have any effect on your actual sense composition uh, yes to some extent 